Welcome to the Online Success Journey Podcast, your opportunity to discover and learn from entrepreneurs like yourself. This is not your typical podcast, but a place where you can get the real story and find out how real people encounter speed bumps and detours, but journey through to find success. Now here's your host for the Online Success Journey Podcast, Patience. Hello everyone and welcome to Online Success Journey. This is episode 100. Are you ready to join the clan? Today we have Jamim Ashley, a mentor, a comedy writer, speaker, and social media. The founder of Tax Design and one half of the Business Experimental Podcast. Her passion is about helping people to experience their individuality and creativity. Hello Jamima. Good morning. How are you? I'm okay. I know here the clan is anxious to hear your story so let's get started with the basics can you can you tell my clan a little bit about your background about what you did before you started your own online business take us right up to the last job or business before you are online um so i actually worked in law enforcement i was working in law enforcement for 10 years here in australia and um i had a was working as a profiler um and as a criminal intelligence analyst and i found my calling in new york city after a chance encounter with a silversmith in New York who changed my life completely and I found jewelry making wow so it's a little bit of a difference right (laughs) I'm just like "Mm, okay and then you happen to be a comedy writer I happen to be a social media Eh, you are very talented (laughs) thank you I'm very busy I don't sleep much very rare (laughs) okay uh why do you do what you do actually I was working in law enforcement for 10 years and I was feeling a little bit burnt out and it just sort of happened by chance that a year earlier I had um, met, I was listening to a book called Tina Fat, by Tina Fey called Bossy Pants and she talked about improvisation comedy as a whole and that really started my journey into creativity and realising that you could work in a creative field. I had always believed that you had to work a nine to five job. So I listened to Bossy Pants by Tina Fey while I was actually driving from Perth to Canberra, which if anyone knows the Australia is about, you know, three and a half thousand kilometers. So it's a fairly hefty drive. And I immediately wanted to do this thing, improvisation. I'd seen it on TV. I'd seen it on shows like Whose Line Is It Anyway? I'd seen it on comedy channels and that sort of thing growing up. And I loved it. And I was like, I didn't realize you could go and do courses in this. So I started doing um, improvisation courses when I moved to Canberra, Australia. And I immediately met all these people who were making a career through creativity. And so this is where the comedy stuff starts to come in. So I started doing you know, a bit of stand-up, started doing a bit of improvisation, started doing a bit of theatre work. And then, um, you know, my skills developed over the last five years, five or six years now I've been an improviser for and doing different comedy writing for different people and, you know, doing my own stand-up and also doing improvisation theatre, which is, you know, my first love. But I met all these people who were doing creative things. So when I met a silversmith, I was like, wow, I could actually feel like I could do this. This is actually something from a creative endeavour. Maybe I don't have to have the nine to five job. And that's sort of where it sort of started from. And out of that, a podcast was born, the Business Experiment podcast. And um, now I'm doing a lot of social media management through Epic Social. So it's been a very, um, it was sort of a chance encounter of listening to Tina Fey bossy pants and then followed by another chance encounter. So I think a bit of the fates were playing a bit of a role in where my career would lead to. What is the most dangerous belief an online entrepreneur can have? I think is that we're limited in our own, we're kind of that we're not ready. I think a huge thing, it's so dangerous that people believe that, you know, you're waiting for the right time to do something. This is a huge problem, especially in the entrepreneurial community. This is something that I, when I mentor people and I, you know, work with them is I'll say things like, oh, I've got this idea, but I'm not ready yet. And I mean, the trick is really none of us are really ready at all. You just kind of have to start. And I think that it's really dangerous that people think that this is also there's an element of get rich quick here and that, you know, we see these courses and there are so many of them out there that say things like you can make seven, six figures in your first year if you follow my systems and you do my step-by-step process. Now, while there's a time and place and why those courses might be helpful, at the same time, they are. it's a little bit dangerous to think that you can use a cookie-cutter approach for entrepreneurship. This is not how that works. 
especially in the online world, things change rapidly and we need to be able to adjust to that. So if someone is there just starting to think that, oh, well, I have an idea, but um, I'm just waiting for the perfect time or oh, I'm just uh, like thinking that the market, mm. the market is full. So what would be your advice to them? You just need to start. You know, there are a lot of people who are not ready. You know, you can't be the person overthinking it. You can't, you're never going to feel ready. And I think that that is the big trick is that it's this idea of saying yes and then figuring out the details later, right? You have to go and just start doing what you're doing. Yes, the market might be full, especially of what you're maybe doing. And that's where you need to have a point of difference. For one thing, you know, there are so many podcasts out there. You listen to a podcast like this one and that the point of difference is that you speak to entrepreneurs who have got a really interesting journey. The point of difference of something like the business experiment was we went and talked about things that no one else was talking about. Did we need another podcast? Arguably no. However, you know, we found a unique point of difference and something we could add to the community. And also we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't have tech background. We just went, okay, how do we do it? And we literally googled how to start a podcast worked in our favor though thankfully we're very grateful for that wow okay let's put the man aside how did you know you are successful in your new business such a tricky question because i think success is so is not necessarily linear you know success i don't think is permanent i don't think that you know in the same way that failure isn't either i think for me i realized i had an element of success was the first time someone recognized me out in public and said i know who you are i love your work you know, can I get a photo with you? I was like, I don't, I don't know you. This is interesting. <laughs> so it's kind of this really jarring moment from law enforcement where I tried really hard not to get my face in the paper down to someone sort of recognizing me and fangirling over me a little. I think for me though, um, I realized I was successful. What felt like real success for me was waking up every morning and being happy to get up at 5 a.m. and go to work for 10, and 10 12, 15 hours because I loved it. I think that that for me was a success because my soul was exhausted from the other jobs I was doing and trying to fit into the world everyone else told me I should be in rather than the job that I was clearly made for. Can anyone be an entrepreneur or are some people more cut out for it than others? I think it's a skill that can be learned. I don't think everyone has what it takes in the sense that you have to be 100% dedicated to what you're doing. You have to love the game and you have to love the dirt. There's this, I say this regularly because people really don't understand. I think, I think entrepreneurship can look really glamorous. I think it can look like a really, really good idea until you start actually having to do the work. And when I say you have to love the dirt, you have to like getting up at 5 a.m. You have to like having really late nights. You need to like not knowing when your next paycheck is going to come in. You have to love to do these things. And there are a lot of people who I don't think can handle that. I'm not saying that people can't learn the skills and this is something that comes with the territories that personal development and, you know, changing almost who you are as a per- you change as a person as you become an entrepreneur. You can learn some of these skills, but I don't think everyone wants to go through the rigmarole of what it's actually like to be an entrepreneur. I think it looks more glamorous than it is. What is one thing that has contributed to your success so far? I'd say the two big things that have contributed to my success. Probably n- the number one is networking. I cannot speak highly enough of networking and building a really good tribe and a good clan of people around you. And mentorship is the other one. And I don't mean mentorship is in going to necessarily pay someone. You can be mentored by famous entrepreneurs. You can consider Tony Robbins a mentor. You can consider Gary Vaynerchuk a mentor. And I really do think that, you know, if you immerse yourself in the the teachings of people and especially the personal development area of other entrepreneurs who have gone before you, will be extremely beneficial. And when you start to meet people in the real world and you are doing networking, you can start to recognize the qualities that you admire in people like Gary Vaynerchuk or Tony Robbins. You can meet people and say, yeah, you know what? This person has similar attributes and then they can become officially a mentor for you. Networking, I think I think your network is literally your net worth. I think that you need to be out there hustling. That's just part of the entrepreneurial game. Again, you've got to love the dirt, but at the same time, you can't be going in and pushing your energy agenda. Networking in a sense is building relationships and going out there and getting your business and your profile out there. That should be, that was 100% of my focus for a long time and it's paid off in every sense of the word. Do you have mentors and coaches? I do. I've had a few different mentors. I uh, would consider, so I started, when I first started my entrepreneurial journey, I had a very good friend of mine who's an entrepreneur as well. Her name is Emma Leanne. She runs Fleurage Perfumery. She's a perfumist. 
So she helped me sort of start off my journey. And then as my career developed, you know, your mentors change. And this is something that I don't think we also speak about often enough. Is it because you start with one mentor? It doesn't mean that you start with that person, that you'll end that journey with them. I think you need to be aiming for, you know, the next 10 years. So who's the person that you want to be next? So from a sense of people that I then stalked, I guess online, I consider Gary Vaynerchuk a huge mentor of mine. I um, He releases something like two hours of content and I may watch 10 minutes of that a day, but I think the story that he tells is he's really authentic as an entrepreneur and I really, really love that. I'm also part of the Inspiring Rare Birds process, um, which I think is mostly in Australia, but I think is starting to grow. And I have a mentor through that system called Raphael Kimberly Bowen. So he's fantastic. I also think that, um, you know, women should try to also get female mentors of people within the entrepreneurial business. I think it just makes life a little bit easier for us. Being an entrepreneur is hard. And I think um, other women understand that as well. There are some additional pressures that go with that. What is the most valuable thing your mentors has told you? Probably to trust my gut more than anything. This is the, again, going to just starting when I've been, when I've been hesitant or been a little bit concerned about starting. I think my mentors have kind of just kicked me in the butt a little bit and reminded me that, you know, I need to trust my, trust myself on this one and that every person is not going to agree with what I'm doing. But if I believe in what I'm doing, it's okay. So, and I think that they really proved to me as well that you really have to love the hard work that goes into being an entrepreneur. You can't pretend there's no way of getting around it you can't pretend that you've done the work you have to actually go and do the hard work so those are probably the two biggest lessons is that you have to really love the hard work that you're doing as well what is one thing no one knows about to jamima so yeah you know- <laughs> I felt I painted myself in a corner a little bit. I have to be very public with my life now as part of the podcast series. Um, what's something that no one really knows about me? I okay. I really, really, really don't like salmon. I think salmon is an overrated food. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really, there's not much else I can think of that people don't know about me. If I don't have a coffee, probably not going to be talking to people. There we go. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) All right. What is the most valuable thing you have ever given away? My time. I think that everything else is, um, is incredibly irreplaceable. You know, I, I do a lot of giveaways for charity events. I, you know, give a lot of time. I give a lot of product away. I, um, do free social media regularly, but I think the one thing that I am always, almost privileged to do is spend time with people who are smarter than me. And one of the things that when I started this journey and people started to mentor me and take care of me and teach me the way of the entrepreneurial land is that I then offered my time to people who were up and coming as entrepreneurs. So that's probably the most valuable thing because, you know, we only have a certain amount of time in the day. Everything else can be replaced. Time cannot. Let's talk about your business. Tell us more about it. So Tang's Design is a bespoke jewelry business, which specializes in doing beautiful, bespoke, colorful pieces. And it specializes in using, it was all made through ethical means. All the products come from ethically sourced businesses um, and all handmade by myself. And we wanted to make an affordable jewelry line for people. One, I work in an area that is highly, has a lot of public servants and has a lot of government bu- businesses and sort of is the nation's capital. So what we wanted to create was something that you could wear out to work and still have some personality and then still go out later for drinks with your friends and still feel fabulous and love that what you're wearing, but not also across the world. The Business Experiment podcast is um, an adventure in itself. We started a podcast wanting to talk about the business real and that's what we did. So we went out and talked to what in real time, what it was like to actually own and operate businesses. And I love doing that. And I do that with a girlfriend of mine, Siobhan Joyce. And I love it. I do. It's one of those beautiful things we get to have a conversation every week about what it's really like to be in business. And what we've done is we've created a community of people that want to tell the truth about what it's like to be in entrepreneurship and not make it look as pretty as most people would like it to be. And then I, yeah, from that sort of another business sort of sprung out of that is called Epic Social, which is a social media management. Um, so I tr- teach people in how to make your social media interesting. We have the tagline of we don't do boring because I think a lot of people get social media wrong. And I think we create content for the sake of it rather than telling the story of who we are as business owners. And I think all of those three businesses link in nicely together in being an authentic, but and being very real and, you know, then also being an entrepreneur on top of that, you know, are some of my favorite things. 
Wow. When do you get time to do all this, Jamima? You do the crafting, the jewelry. Then you, yes. from there, you are into podcasts. Then from there, you are into social media. Where do you get the time from? Oh, is there an extra time in Australia for us around the world we don't have? <laughs> yeah, so Australia actually offers four extra hours. Uh, it's fantastic. No, um, the, the trick is really good time management. It is, you know, and delegating where appropriate, having a team members around you that if you can afford to get people on board to help you, things like virtual assistants are amazing. And having, again, having that good network where you can sort of pass things off if you get stressed and ask people to help you out with things. I think for me, time management is 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 paramount. I truly get the most amount of work done between the hours of 5am and 7am because no one else is awake. My emails aren't coming in. I love the quiet. I love getting up in the morning, having a coffee and starting work early. It's a, it's a bit of a trick and no one else is awake then. No one else is going to, you know, the doorbell isn't ringing. People aren't calling yet. Everyone else is sleeping and you're getting two or three hours of work done. And if you really sit down and do two or three hours of work, you can knock out the majority of the work that you have to do for that day. It's surprising how easily distracted we are, especially, you know, when you sit down, we have to be focused with what we're doing. Use your time efficiently. Okay. On Epic Social Media, social media now is very uh, vast. Every day there is a new platform coming out. The next day that one is closed. So how do you stay uh, updated? So I think the key thing for anyone that's looking for social media businesses is you need to deal with practitioners. So I think there are a lot of businesses out there that do things like that will tell you that they can do amazing things with social media and really only then go and go, oh, we only do Facebook, we only do Instagram. And those, and don't get me wrong, Facebook and Instagram are a huge portion of what I do, but you need to have, you know, the right platforms for what you're doing. And I think you need to deal with people who know what is best for your business. And I think that that's where your customer avatar and these sort of things come into it. I think that when people do, you know, there are so many different social media platforms. I think that how I personally stay on top of them all is Facebook alerts and Google alerts because they let me know when new things are coming out and to go and look for Also, I have tapped the millennial generation. They're the ones that are going to tell us where the next, the trends are coming from. They were the ones that said, you know, two years before Snapchat became what it is now, Snapchat is going to be a thing. So the millennials are actually the ones that indicate where things are going. And um, I think the younger generation definitely know the social media platform because you start looking at it, you know, Facebook was just a younger generation. And when all of their parents moved into Facebook, they all went, okay, we're going to go across to something else. Instagram came. Instagram then was, you know, replaced. All the parents started getting on Instagram. Suddenly all the kids are like, we need something new. We need to get away from our parents. They're onto Snapchat. So I think that's really where I sort of find out where the, you know, the best things are coming from. And there are so many and there's so many ones that are failing but I mean you know Facebook is not going anywhere if they change nothing about their business model for the next 10 years they're not going anywhere if someone is starting and then they are looking to uh, social media platform or looking for you said the the virtual assistant is very important what are the qualities should we look for a virtual first and foremost I think you need to be getting recommendations from other people I think you look at sites like Fiverr and Upwork who are who are amazing and have definitely have their time and place but it is a little bit of Russian roulette of who you're going to get and you aren't necessarily going to get the most amazing people for the best job. I think if you're looking for a virtual assistant, first and foremost, start with recommendations. I have no issues with sending work internationally and sending the places overseas. I would definitely actually promote doing that for some of the things. If you're just looking at having content create, you know, Canva posts created or having graphic design images created and just popped onto your website, you know, there's definitely a time and place for that as well. I think probably the the thing that you want to find first and foremost is someone who's very open with communication and just remember the amount of money that you're paying should really reflect the the quality of work that you're getting back as well. So if you're, you know, if you are going through Fiverr, you are going to have to proofread everything really, really thoroughly. If you are going through something like Upwork and you're paying a couple hundred dollars, then you are, you know, you may, may not have to have the same scrutiny of products that are coming through your door. But start with recommendations from people because I think that that is the whole community as a whole. People that are good, we are willing to share on. And this is a key trait of entrepreneurs as well as we're willing to share our knowledge and our inside information. So start with recommendations from people that you know. Okay. Where do we find the Jamima? So you can find me at my website, uh, jemimaashley.com.au. You can also find me at epicsocial.com.au and the Business Experiment Podcast. What clientele do you take on for mentoring? What Do you take on like beginners, middle, uh, people who have already established? What clientele? 
Um, I have worked with startups, definitely. I usually find I usually work with people in a mentoring sense of people from the when they sort of are sort of at maybe the first two years of their journey. That's when I really love working with clients is when they're sort of starting out their journey and maybe have just kind of gotten you know a few years in and going I'm not really sure what the next direction is. I think startups are really fun to work with because they're so easily malleable. You can actually sort of you know it's really the difference between if you course correct an entrepreneur at the start of their journey. This is you know it's like a plane taking off, right? You can either have them land in you know in Texas or you can have them land in Fiji. Really, just that tiny course correction at the start of that journey can it make the world of difference from where the entrepreneur ends up and I you know I, my favorite people to deal with are people who have sort of gotten through the startup phase but are really really dedicated and having probably a little bit more drive but um, I work with male female I'm not really concerned and I I spe- I don't specialize coming and talking about how to make you feel better about your business I come in and give you fresh ideas and go this is where you, you know have you considered doing this have you looked at that while well, this is your target you know, avatar, maybe your avatar is actually this. Do you want to change your customer base? Where do you want to drive your business in the next five years? Wow. Okay. So, Klan, there will be more from Jamim in a moment. If you are finding Jamim's journey interesting and you are ready to hear more, come and listen to the full version of the interview at onlinesuccessjourney.com. If you are on Online Success Journey already, click on part two of Jamim's journey and you'll get more tips and information to help you with your own business startup and journey. And don't forget you can access all other Online Success interview podcasts on the site as well. That's a wrap, Klan. Remember, success is a journey. Patience and Jemima. This is not the end of the journey. We hope you've enjoyed listening to part one and want to be sure you know there is a second part to this and every journey podcast at onlinesuccessjourney.com. Filled with even more success tips, uplifting stories, and even a bit of fun, there are dozens of episodes only available to the members of the Online Success Journey clan. Check out the website and click on Join the Clan for more information. Patience would like to thank you for listening to this podcast, and she has a free audio gift for you at her website. Go to OnlineSuccessJourney.com for instant access to this gift. Of course, you know that listening to the journeys of others helps each of us chart our own path, so make sure you're subscribed to be notified as each new interview is posted. There are so many ways to stay connected to the online success journey and to listen in. And if you're enjoying the podcast, we appreciate your help in telling others. One of the best ways to share the benefit you get is to rate and review it at Stitcher and other sites by clicking the stars or completing the ratings form. By clicking the thumbs up and leaving a comment on YouTube or liking and sharing the podcast on social media. To review the podcast within iTunes, simply open iTunes to the podcast, click on Ratings and Reviews, then write a review. On behalf of Patience and until next time, thanks once more for listening. It is our hope that this podcast will guide you on your own online success journey.